does to me. Um, so we've been talking about authentic grace. And uh, in my part, I've been doing the book of Romans because um, that's how God opened grace up to me. I guess it's been maybe 15 or 18 years ago um, that we've been preaching it. And, um, you know, grace is simply this, Jesus. Because John says, um, of his fullness we have received grace for grace. So grace, grace is a beautiful um, exchange. Um, one scripture says it, it says um, that Jesus was made poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. You see the exchange? So Jesus came and laid down his life to be able to provide for riches for us. It's a free exchange. It doesn't cost anything. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. I love the scripture uh, in Hebrews that says, come boldly to the throne of grace. So even the very throne room of God is called grace. And that, that's beautiful to me. Even come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I, I'm continually learning to practice and, and to understand grace. And uh, in fact, this past week, I'm like, God, I am coming to you. I need grace for this area. That I, I'm just not that strong in this area. I can't tell you when we built this building, there were many times here and other buildings that I would be alone and I'd be frustrated. Like, I have no idea what to do here. I don't, I don't get it. It doesn't come naturally to me. I, I'm not a builder in my natural self. I'm just not. Um, and that kind of thing. And so I would just sit there on the ground. I would sit down and I'd ask for help. No kidding. I know that sounds funny. But that's exactly what I would do. I would ask for help. I'd ask for grace. Like, what do I do here? And then he'd give me an idea. I'm like, oh, I should have thought about that. No, I wouldn't have thought about that. That's the beauty of grace. That's the beauty of God. That's the beauty is the Holy Spirit goes, here's your answer. So grace is this divine exchange. How many know that, you know, sin leads to death? We know that. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life um, and in Romans. And so, so we were on our way, the way we think, to death in our life, to many areas. And then God interrupts and gives us grace. Go, oh, by the way, here's grace to be a good husband. Here's grace to be a good father. Here's grace to, uh, to be able to live life. See, grace isn't something that is the doctrine necessarily, although it is. But grace is a relationship. Grace is Jesus. Grace is, is, is having confidence in your heart that you're a son or a daughter and you can come boldly to God. You don't have to be afraid of God. Now, now you have to understand that the church started out this way and then went into the dark ages and everything became about earning and deserving and, and punishment and if you don't agree with me, we kill you. And all this stuff happened in the church. And all the time, Jesus was kind of set on the back burner. And man took over the church. If you study church history, you'll find that man took over the church and did a horrible job. Horrible job. So, so God, you know, they always say revival is just God going, okay, you misrepresented me long enough. I'm going to just show up now and actually show you what I'm like. And that's where when Jesus shows up, there's miracles, there's healings, hearts are mended, people. I've been in services, literally, 15, or, sorry, 1,500 people there, packed out building where everybody's having an intimate encounter with God all at the same time in the way they needed it. It was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. God came into pain and frustration and hurt and brought the truth into that situation and people were crying all over the building and wailing all over the building because God came and said, look, I care about the brokenhearted. I care about those who have been in messes and don't know how to get out. I'm the divine exchange. 
And so a lot of people, we just, you know, sometimes as Christians, we live our life, and it's like God is just part of our life, but he's not our life. Paul the Apostle said, Christ who is my life. Why? Because he's in me. I am the body of Christ. I'm part of the body of Christ. And so, uh, but I, I just love grace. It's just a divine exchange. That's all it is. It's me taking my life and taking his life and making it my life. And, and it, not part of my life, making it my life. Because, see, this is what I look at. Doesn't the creator know exactly the gifts and callings and talents in, in you? Doesn't he? Do you know them all? Nobody knows all the time. In fact, you won't even know until you actually try something, and you're like, going, oh, gosh, I'm really good at that. In fact, you may be really afraid of doing it like I was. I grew up with a lot of fear because I watched things happen in my life. I watched my friend get kidnapped right in front of me, created a lot of fear. I was only like 11 or 12 in sixth grade, and uh, I watched him get kidnapped right in front of me. Now, tell me that doesn't create fear. So from that moment on, I ran everywhere. So, and, you know, and I could run it. I could run and, and run and run and, um, and, and rarely ever got tired. And, but part of that started because of fear. Instead of faith, instead of knowing who I was as a son, Instead of kicking out, God t d d does this exchange. So here's what God does. He's like, he tricks you. So he takes you on this journey to get rid of fear. So the first thing he did is said, well, you know, I'm going to have you get on the choir and start to sing and choir. And then all of a sudden the choir director says, I want you to sing this special. Oh, wait a minute. It's okay if I sing with a group of people but a special? Uh, no, I don't think so. And they kept, she kept bugging me until I did it. But then the first, that was, but I still had a bunch of people around me, right? So then I went from that to, to uh, uh, singing a special in front of everybody. Worst experience of my life. Well, close to it, but pretty bad. So if you could picture somebody that's, behind a pulpit were the words right here, and because you knew you were going to mess up, you had your book in your hand to read them so you cannot screw up because you're going to screw up. And uh, I just knew I was, so I was so afraid. Here's the problem. I was shaking so bad I couldn't read anything. I, I'm not kidding you. I was doing this. I'm like, okay, so I sat it down, and I'm still shaking. So it's still hard to read, but I got through it. And then, of course, during that whole time period, God calls us to be youth pastors. And I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm shy by nature. I am. I know that seems weird, but I am. I don't like people that much overall to, in a big setting. I like one or two people, friends. You know, we sit down go to a ball game together, go have coffee to get whatever, that's great. But a big crowd, that's not great. So to me, that's, but, but see, then, and, and, but here's what happened, is, is um, I would turn it all over to my wife. You do it, honey. You preach to those kids. I'll be there for you. Way to go. Go get them, baby. You can do it. And so I would skip out of church, and I'd go play ball because I was very comfortable in my skin playing butt, basketball, football, baseball, softball, you name it, anything I kicked. I loved all that. I was very confident in that. So I would go do that, and then I'd come late um, to the service and that kind of thing. And then God interrupted me, said, excuse me, you have nothing to give these kids. And I said, well, I know that. What's new? I, I did. I, I didn't have anything to give them. Why? Because only thing I could have given was me, not Jesus, because I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Now, I accepted him, but he was just my salvation, my insurance to make heaven, which the Bible doesn't really teach that, by the way. But anyway, that's what I believed. So, so, so then, 
Uh, you know, um, uh, God came to me and said, you have nothing given. And he said, he wanted to give me this divine exchange. He wanted to give me grace to help me, to help people. And so I start to pray, and the biggest confidence, the biggest thing that ever, one of the biggest moments in my life, there was a little girl who had been adopted by a family in our church. She came up to me and she said, Pastor Tim, Pastor Tim, I said, what, what? She said, you're a prayer. I can tell. The best compliment I ever had is what somebody could see God on me. It was the biggest, biggest compliment ever. You know, it's interesting. Why do we need exchanges? I'll give you a story. So when I was young, my, my daddy had a serious uh, uh, brain injury because of a high temperature when he was young. So my dad couldn't support me. He didn't get behind me, go, go, son, you can make it, go, go. Daddies have this way, and some mamas too, of encouraging their kids to do things they never could probably do without that encouragement, without that maybe little tweaking and correction. And Pastor Darren got the privilege of, of coaching his son uh, this year in basketball and encouraging him even in the middle of getting their shot blocked, that, that kind of thing. So I was telling um, this, a story to a guy at our church or our, at our work, and I said, I said, when I was in junior high, uh, and, and, and elementary, I was the fastest kid in my school, very fast, and I was wiry, wiry strong. So, so I had a, my best friend was Tom Larson, and he, in seventh grade, could bench press 250 pounds six times in seventh grade. Most people don't even have muscles yet in seventh grade. <laughs> I didn't. And so he, and, 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 so he was on the wrestling team. So he was all city. He was one of the best, well, best wrestler in the city at 175 pounds. I wrestled with him all the time. He taught me the guillotine, which, by the way, I don't remember how to do it, because if I did remember how to do it, I could cause you great pain. Because it literally, you feel like you're being ripped apart. And then the chicken wing, and the double chicken wing, and all these, I know there's weird names, but they're actually names for moves in wrestling. So. Because I wrestled him, I could actually beat the varsity wrestler in my school. I could beat him, but I never wrestled, except for with my friend, because I had no confidence. I, I, I was never pushed. I was never believed that there was something more. So I got into high school. I'm in 10th grade, we have gym class, and I have lots of friends who are in track and all that kind of stuff because I did a lot of athlete uh, stuff. And, and so we had to be timed in all the races. So in the, in the 220, it wasn't meters then, it was, 200, it was a 220 um, yard dash. Um, I ran that in 25 flat in, a, in, in tennis shoes on a cinder track. Now you have to understand, I was in a class A school the best runners in our school were running 23-7, I think. I was off them by a second. Do you think I ever ran? No. Do you think I ever, I had nobody to push me. Nobody to believe in me. Nobody to say, look how fast you are naturally. Do you understand with a little training? that you could have been one of the best in this state, you could have done something great. But because I had no confidence, no papa, no daddy to actually push me, I just played all the sports and had a great time. Played basketball with Magic Johnson and in, in high school. I had a great time doing that. One of my best friends, well, good friends, went to the University of Creighton, which is a big basketball college, and that kind of thing. And, and I got to play with them all the time. But because I had no confidence, I never went out for the varsity team. 
I never had anybody push me. See, here's what happens. It, God, the Papa, that's why he created grace. He created grace so you could do things that you don't believe you could do. And, and he gave this view of God that God is a good Papa who believes in everything you do in life. So I have to tell you a story. I'm telling a story to this guy at work. He said, I got a story for you. I said, okay. He said, he said, my dad never came to anything I did. And he played all kinds of sports, and he decided he was downstate at a big school. That school ended up winning multiple state championships in wrestling. And he, he went out for the team in his junior year. He only wrestled two years. And, uh, and so he's in the crowd one day, and all of a sudden he sees his dad. He's like, what is my dad doing here? My dad never come to anything I've ever done. So he gets and he wrestles this guy and he wrestles him with all of his might. Why? Because he's trying to impress his dad that he was valuable. And he wrestles this guy with all of his might, all of his strength, and this guy gets him in a guillotine and gets him locked up and the thing ends and he loses five to three. And he went to his, dad, his coach, and his coach goes, that was one of the best wrestling I have seen. Now, this guy coached all state guys. He said, you did fabulous. You did incredible. I, I want you to know. And he said, he said, my dad was here. And he said, I invited your dad. He said, what? He said, you invited my dad, and he came? He said, yes. You know why I invited him? Because you were wrestling the state champion from last year. He had no clue what happened. Papa brought out the best in this young man who there's no way he should have been able to compete with this All-State guy. Second year, first or second year in wrestling. Wrestling takes sometimes seventh, eight, eight ninth, tenth, you know, to, to build your stamina and your moves and learning the moves and that kind of thing, one of the hardest things to do. But here's the beauty of grace is God so believes in us that he's looking at everybody going, I see talent in you. Maybe you didn't want to be a preacher, but that's what I saw. Maybe you didn't want to get up in front of people, but I see worship on you. Maybe you don't want to handle ladies stuff, but the, you know what I see? I see a whole create. A beautiful woman who will do a beautiful job, who will come out of her shell and do something great. Because, see, that's, that's our papa. That's God. That's how he looks at us. Many of us just stay in the shadows. I would have stayed in the shadows, but God wanted me to be a youth pastor for 23 years. He did. And I absolutely loved it. When I actually made an exchange of my strength for his strength, I fell in love with these kids, and I don't care, you know, what they did, what was happening. I wasn't leaving them. We were sticking with them. We were loving them. See, that's how God is. He believes. That's what grace is. That's why he's a good father. He's a good father. You know, I, I mean, could, could I go back and wish I had a different dad? No, I don't. I'm thankful. My dad was a hard worker. He taught me to work hard. My daddy never missed a day of work, ever. I never remember him. He was healthy. He was strong. He had these Popeye arms. They used to beat the daylights out of me with. He was so strong. He had big old Popeye, Popeye forearms. But, so I don't look back, but, but, but I learned something. You see, I learned that a good Papa can bring out things that may not get brought out. And see, God did that in my life a lot. As I got older, and he kept saying, you can do this. Why would you pick somebody who knows nothing about building to help build like five churches? Why? 
I don't know. I wouldn't pick me. But see, God wants you to rely on him. That's the exchange of grace. Because, see, if you got it all together, I'm the smartest dude, I'm the richest dude, I'm to this, what do you need faith for? You don't think you need grace. Yeah, all that was just free. I haven't even went to a scripture yet. So, you know what I found is, you know, I used to think, well, God, nobody has been preaching grace it, when I first started preaching, I had never heard another preacher. And then somebody came up and said, you preach like this person. I'm like, I do? He said, yeah. And then I went to them, and then I brought his book, and I'm like, wow, this guy is really good. But here's the thing. I, I get this uh, guy. He's a Catholic guy, and he's wonderful. His name is Richard Rohr, and, and he, he went back to St. Francis. Well, St. Francis didn't live long. But St. Francis had these keys. He saw the church going to militaristic, I mean, you know, punishment and rules and all this stuff. And he's like, throw all that aside. What? That's not Jesus. And he did that in his life. And I started reading about his things. I'm like, I'm not going to read it all today, but I'm like, wow, wow. He had a key in the midst of he watched and I'm not against the Catholic Church, but he watched his pope start going in that way, and, you know, there were wars and all kinds of stuff, and, and he just backed up and went, I want to live like Jesus. I want to talk like Jesus because he's grace. That's what he did. In the middle of everything that was contrary. So what I learned is there have been people walk in an intimate relationship. But with, by the way, grace is an intimate relationship with God. It's not like a side thing. It's like, it's like God who is my life. When he appears, I shall be like him. What does that tell you? It tells you on the inside you're like God. It just needs brought out. It doesn't need condemned. It doesn't need criticized. It doesn't mean look at somebody and say, you shouldn't do that. You're going to hell for that. What's wrong with you? No, it means let me bring out God in you. And when you bring out God in somebody, sin just falls off. The closer you get to God, sin just drops. You know, I, I have a lot of scriptures in Romans uh, chapter 6 and verse 6. Here, here's the thing that really bothers me. People think that we're born with a sin nature. Nowhere in scripture does it say that. Nowhere. It was a made-up doctrine. Here's why. If I was made and you were made in the image of God, is God sin? You were handcrafted in the womb, Scripture says, by God himself. He created you, and he knit you, and he made you exactly the way he wanted you to be with the type of brain that you would have, the type of heart, the to everything. He created you in his image. Is the image of God sin? No. That doctrine was made up and doesn't exist in the Bible. It was a made-up doctrine, which is really quite sad because you know why? I hate to say this, but preachers wanted to keep you in the seat every week. So if I can keep you, Jeff, in this seat every week by telling you you're no good, that you need me, that you need God, you better repent every week, come to church and repent because I'm going to preach something, some sin that you're doing, the preacher's going to preach, and then you're going to repent, and then you're going to believe that you need to come next week because there's going to be something else. That is a sad way to have a relationship. Could you imagine your mate every week pointing out a flaw in your life, not to help you, but to condemn you? 
Could you imagine your mate being that way? I can't. Everything that should be for our benefit of where we're going with God. Besides that, the old man was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. See, this divine exchange happened many years ago. I was crucified with him. I was buried with him. I was raised in resurrection power. That means that God's presence flows through me all the time. You know, if we'd realized, you know, Steve's not in here right now, but Pastor Darren, come up. So, so here, here's what, what I do. You know what? I believe that God is in me, and then when I hug somebody, God goes in them through me. His presence. So I... Steve, when he first came, I would hug him, and he'd start to let go, and I wouldn't. <laughs> and guess how Steve hugs me now? Exactly like that. Why? He's, I said, I have to feel your heart. I, I, I want you to feel the presence of God in my heart. That I love you. Because that's what grace is. Grace is pure love. Because that's Jesus. And, you know, I'm at work, and somebody will get a really good sale, three, four, five thousand. I always go up to them, because I, I look on how everybody did, and I'll go up to them and say, man, that was a great sale. Way to go. No matter if I had a frustrating day, no matter if I sold anything that day. Why? Because I'm going to celebrate them. Because that's what God does. He celebrates us. Every little thing, every big thing, he celebrates us. I... So our old man was crucified. Sin was done away. I'm no longer a slave. Death has no dominion. Romans 6, 12 says, reckon yourself dead sin and alive unto God. He said, it says, apparently God believes we have the power to sin or not to sin because it says, therefore, I'm going to read it to you. Because of that, you're dead to sin. You're alive to God. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your body. Apparently, he thinks that God is so powerful in you that you can stop sinning no matter how bad it is. When you recognize that you're under grace, not under law, you're not under guilt and shame and condemnation, that you walk as a son, that you go boldly to the throne, that you get help to change... So he said, therefore, because of the knowledge, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. So apparently he thinks that the grace of God will give you the strength to get out of anything. But see, that's an intimate relationship with God. You go to God and say, hey, I got a drinking problem. God, like he doesn't know, but he likes us to have conversations with him. So I don't want to do this anymore. I'm hurting my family, hurting my children. And you said, because you're my father, because you did not create me to be in bondage and slavery, you've given me the authority to walk as a son, to take authority over this addiction and this slavery in my body. I declare today that I am free. And I thank you, Father, for your grace that when I lust after it, instead I'll lust after you in a good way. That you won't obey it in its lust. I'm just going to hop around. I want to show you something. Um, Romans 
7 and verse 1. I love the book of Romans because this is what really set me free. It says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she would be called an adulteress. Here's what's happening, guys. When you put law in your life, you're actually becoming an adulterer. And I'm going to show you why. When, when, when you go back and forth between law and grace, it's like having two lovers. Your wife and another. And so when we look at this, it says, but if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if the husband, remember it's talking about law, not talking about marriage here. She is free from the law that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Why? Because you died with Christ. That's why you became dead to the law. That you may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that you would bear fruit. When you consider that Jesus is your husband, there's this false doctrine that the marriage supper of the Lamb is somewhere in the future, in the, in the book of Revelation, and what people don't understand, you're already married. You're married to God. You're dead to the law because the law you were married to before, you, we weren't actually, but although the church put us under a lot of law, and so what happens is we became married to that law, and we become adulterous, and, and, and we were always guilty, and we were always confused, and we are always thinking that God doesn't love us. And he said, you become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Because why? Because you were crucified with Christ. You were raised with him. That you might be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead. Who was raised from the dead? Jesus. You were married to him. It's a false doctrine that someday... We're going to be married to Christ. No, because you can't produce any fruit. Husbands and wives produce fruit. You can't produce fruit if you're not married to God. We put the book of Revelation in the future. It's actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of who God is. He's your husband. It's the unveiling of who Jesus actually is. See, the laws the law did is stir up sin in us. Grace, when you develop a relationship, stirs up righteousness. Stirs up holiness. Your fruit is holiness. It's about an intimate relationship with God. I'm not going to get into too much of this. Others, you know, there, but I'll just mention this briefly. There's two mindsets. The mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. The mind of the spirit is God's Holy Spirit talking to you, encouraging you, strengthening you, opening up scriptures to you. The mind of the flesh is just what most people live in, even most Christians. Whatever the dictate of the flesh is, that's what they do. If the spirit doesn't have full place or have a place to actually help them to become like God. So, like, for example, I, I think I gave this back a while ago. You can tell if you have a mind of the flesh or a mind of the spirit. Here's a great example. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. So the mind of the flesh says, we'll take you in all kinds of roads. They did me dirty. I'm never going to talk to them again. 
I'm going to talk about them. I'm going to criticize them. I'm going to, I'm going to tell all my friends how they did me dirty and how rotten they are. That's the mind of the flesh. The mind of the spirit says what Jesus said, to pray for those who despitefully use you. So how many go around praying every day for their enemy? That's how you can tell if you have the mind of the flesh or the mind of the spirit. The mind of the flesh leads to death. What death? You'll never have that relationship again. It's dead. Not only that, you're causing other people to hate that person by, by gossiping. So the mind of the spirit says, pray for those who despitefully use you. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those. So how many have baked a pie for their enemy lately? How many walk around and go, Father, thank you for whatever. We'll just say George. Thank you for George. Thank you, Father, that you have such an amazing plan for his life. Father, I just release him to you. I pray. You know the scripture that says he heaps coals of fire on them? That's not a bad thing. That's actually God working on them. Because fire is a purifying agent. So that scripture is about God coming and actually purifying them. Because why? Because God wants everybody useful for the kingdom. So to bless them means, you know, the word bless is eulogy, that we do at a funeral, that we thank God for their life and, and say all these wonderful things about them. Right? So that's the word bless. So we bless them. Father, thank you for their life. Thank you for blessing them financially, physically. They might have just cheated you out of $10,000. They might have cheated you out of $10,000. What do you do with that? Well, mind of the flesh, you hate them. You tell all your friends. Well, the mind of the spirit, what would happen if you did the mind of the spirit and God went to them in a dream and said, pay them back? You don't know, right? But we do know what will happen when you do the other because it will bring death in every situation. That's why it says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is the carnal mind. The law of the spirit of life is the mind of Christ. And scripture says we have the mind of Christ. And the wisdom of God is formed within me. So the first thing you do is you learn that scripture. I have the mind of Christ, and the wisdom of God is formed within me. I have the mind of Christ, and the wisdom of God is formed within me. I have the mind of Christ, and the wisdom of God is formed. That means God is working. He's doing something on the inside of you to make you like him. So we're married to God. You're not going to be married. You are married. And you have the ability to produce fruit when you connect with that mind of the spirit. You can be a fruit producer. Bear fruit unto God. I'm going to just um, go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. And we're going to close on this. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation of those in Christ Jesus. Forget about walking in the flesh according to the spirit. That was added by commentators. That was added. It's not in the original language. In the original Greek, it doesn't exist. There is therefore now no condemnation of those in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you know your papa is there for you. You know he loves you. He doesn't judge you. He doesn't condemn you. There isn't any in God. Other people might condemn you and judge you, but there isn't any in God. There is therefore, because you're buried with him in baptism, raised in resurrection power, you're seated at the right hand of God. You think about this, you guys. If God doesn't remember your sin anymore, doesn't count it anymore, and you're seated at the right hand of God, how can you be a no good loser when you're right next to God? You can't be. It's a mindset. 
And those mindsets have to fall at the name of Jesus in an intimate relationship with grace. There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to flesh, according to the Spirit. Next verse. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. So that law, that old, he made you free. It's our choice to walk in that freedom. But he made you free. The more we get it, set our mind on him, has made me free from the law of sin and death. Next verse. For the law, what the law could not do, and it was weak through the flesh. So you can tell if you're under law or think you're under law because you always look at your flesh. It's weak through the flesh. God sinned by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he judged sin in the flesh. Next verse. Verse 4. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh. So the righteous requirement of the law was fulfilled. Pastor Darren did a masterful job in talking about if you have a mortgage and you pay that mortgage off, you now own it. There's no more debt. The law was fulfilled in Christ. You have no more debt. And now we get the choice. We get the privilege of walking in the Spirit and, and living in the Spirit. You know, Acts chapter 1, when it said, uh, uh, when they gathered together, he said that, that he'll give them power to be a witness. You know, all of us Americans think, oh, that's wonderful. I'll have the... Uh, presence of God in me and the power to be a witness. Here's the problem. The word witness there means martyr. <laughs> they had the power to actually trust their life with God, whether I live or whether I die, it's Christ. That's what Paul the Apostle said. Whether I live or whether I die, it's Christ. All the apostles died as martyrs. Peter hung upside down on the cross all of them but John. The apostle John lived to be about 100 years old. They tried to boil him in water or oil, and that's why they sent him to Patmos. And then he has this understanding and revelation of Christ from the book of Revelation and fully seeing Christ in his glory. And so, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Go to the next verse. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Oh, here we go. I can be a Christian, and I can set my minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. It's a choice. And God doesn't make you do anything. He just wants to know, here's, here's, here's the choice. You know, in the Old Covenant, they had two choices. Obey the law and, and have life. Obey the, don't, disobey the law and have death. Well, that was physical death, by the way. You, you know, if you were caught in adultery, they stoned you. They killed you. But now it's talking about the things of our life. If I want to walk in life, guess what? I'm going to learn how to walk with God in my relationship with my wife, my children, the people at my work. Right? I can't tell you how many Christians I've met. They go from job to job, job to job, job to job, job to job. Well, my boss is mean. My boss is ugly. My boss doesn't like me. The people don't like me. Really? Why don't you walk in the spirit? And why don't you get your enemies to love you? Because it's possible. I've had it. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So we set our minds on the things of the Spirit. What's the things of the Spirit? Forgiveness, loving people, love my wife, for as Christ loved the church and given my life to her for her. Right? Next verse. For to be kind and carnally minded is death. See, you're still going to heaven. But you got to get your mindset off that I didn't get saved to go to heaven. I got saved to bring heaven to earth. Yeah, exactly. Heaven is just a reward. 
But guess what? Do you think I want to live miserably on this earth? Do you think I want to go through five wives? Do you think I want to go from job to job to job because everybody hates me? Do you really think I want to live that way? Of course not. So learn to have your, a spirit-led mind. Why? Because it's life and peace. The word peace is shalom. It means nothing missing, nothing broken. It doesn't mean life will be perfect. No, it doesn't mean that. It's just that when the spirit is involved, he works all things together for your good, even in the midst of tragedy. Next verse. Because the carnal mind is enmity, or basically at war against God. Doesn't that, isn't that an oxymoron? God's kids are at war with him. That's an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense. H how can God's kids be at war with him? By thinking totally different than how he thinks. Because the carnal mind is against God. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Verse 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you. If you had a child and you asked them to go do the dishes, did they just please you because they went and did the dishes? Yes. If they don't go and do the dishes, are you pleased? No. Do you still love them? Yeah. Yeah. You'd lay your life down for them, right? But you're pleased when they do what they're asked. And God just says, let's learn to walk in the Spirit. Let's learn to have the mind of Christ. Next verse. But you, I love this verse. <laughs> but you are not in the flesh. Can you live with, out of the mind of the flesh? Yes. But here he's saying, you're not in the flesh. You're in the spirit if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So you're actually in the spirit. You're just not tapping into it. So you learn to tap into it. And, and here's, what, you know, in the morning, I get up. Listen, I have to confess you. I don't read 14,000 verses when I pray. Nor do I go, God, give me this, God, give me that, God, give me this, God, do, give me that. I don't pray that way. If I have a need, I do go to him and tell him. But see, I understand that every day is different. When you're in sales, you can have a day of zero. You can have a day of negative. People cancel. But that negative day doesn't change my mindset that God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. So what I do is I thank him for every customer that I'll have today. Father, thank you for all my customers. Thank you, Father, that, that I will have the chance to affect their life for good in some way. And if I have something that would be a blessing to them, here's I. Here's the difference between a, wild, um, a carnal mind and a spirit mind. A spirit mind wants the best for you. So if you're my customer, I'm not there to try to sell you something you don't want. I'm there to help you find what you want. So I pray that God, if they, if, I, like I'll give a quote, okay? Give you an example, I'll give a quote. And here's how I pray. When, after they leave, I pray, I say, Father, the next day, I say, Father, if this would be good for them, and it'd be a blessing to them, then remind them to call me. And I asked my angels for help. I said, remind them to call me. You'd be surprised. I've had calls months after. I had forgot about it, but God never forgets. And they'd call me and say, hey, Tim, 
I'm going to have to reprice that whole thing. You know, we've had three price changes since I gave you that quote. <laughs> Pastor Darren gets that one. So now you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if, if the spirit of God dwells in you. So I, can, I need to activate the spirit. Not only do I have the mind of Christ, I have the mind of Christ, but as I meditate on scripture, like I will just sit there in my seat and worship, and I'll just sit and go, God, you're my daddy. What does that mean? My papa. Because see, I had a dad that couldn't do some things. So what is it? I need his help understanding what a good daddy is. Does that make sense? Because my daddy was good in a lot of things. But he wasn't capable of bringing out the best in me. So I say, well, God, you said you're my father. What does a father do? He takes care of you. Well, that's why you said in Scripture to, to not worry about what you would eat or what you would drink or what you would put on, but seek your kingdom first and see how that tied together. And then I'm like, so how do I seek your kingdom? Well, it's righteousness, peace, and joy. So, Father, help me to understand how right I am with you. And help me to walk in a peace knowing you're with me and the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that's how I pray. It's not, God, give me this, God, give me that, do this, do that. No. I just want him to talk to me in the middle of my prayer time. And, and then he'll bring a scripture to you. Oh, yeah, that's really good. That connects with that you're my father because your father takes care of people. He wants to bless his kids. That's his heart. So I want that heart. Don't you want that heart? You want to bless our children. You want to bless your children. You want to bless your children, right? So, so I want that to become part of me. So I think like him and have the mind of Christ. I need to close this. I would like to, to dismiss everybody who wants to dismiss. But I'd like to pray for everybody who like hands laid on them. As a papa, I'm representing my papa to stir up things in you that you would believe that you could do anything God wants you to do. Be successful and do things you don't even think you're capable of doing. And I want to just lay hands on you, Pastor Darren and I, lay hands on you and stir up those things. You may not even know what they are yet, but God has them planned. So, Father, and as you go out, if you can be respectful while we pray for other people, but I want to respect those who need to go. Father, thank you for today. And thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that we're your child, and you're a good, good papa. Thank you for grace. Thank you for the divine exchange. Thank you, Jesus. You were made poor. You left heaven. You were made poor so that I could be made rich. Rich in what? Rich in all kinds of things that pertain to life. Thank you, Father. Help us to represent you in everything we do. Help us to understand we have the mind of Christ and activate that in daily life. We thank you, Father, for it. In Jesus' name. So those who need to go, you can go. If you'd like hands laid on you, please come up. And Pastor Darren, we're just going to activate that Papa's life in your life. And I don't care what age you are. I don't care if you're from 2 to 90. 
Because you know what? There's still a future for everybody. You'd be surprised. They say that 60 and 70 year old men are the most productive time of their life. And 80 is really close to it actually too. I know that sounds funny, but that's what they've researched. So please come up if you'd like to come up. And we release you to the blessings of God this week. Amen.